All right, welcome everybody. Today's event is hosted by the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of British Columbia. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to broadening our shared understanding of Chinese history in BC through research, documentation, preservation, and education. My name is Christy, and I'm a board member of the society. And we are joined here tonight by Rob Ho and John Atkin, who are co-vice presidents, Sarah Ling, our president, and Dominic Bautista. Please mute yourself if you are not Hi. presenting tonight. Hey, three thing. Are you busy? Uh, we've got someone. All right. Sorry about that. If you want to learn more about our organization and what do we what we do, please visit us at cchsbc.ca. For the rest of this winter, we've got some upcoming events. The Chinatown Pretty Book Talk will be having a launch on November 19th at 7 p.m. Pacific time. You can register via bit.ly slash cpvan2020. We also have our 2020 Lynn Lecture, Yellow Peril Racial Fear and Pandemics in Canada, featuring the speaker Dr. Renissa Milani from UBC, with support from Dr. Laura Ishiguro and Ms. Naomi Bui. You can register and learn more about these events at www.cchsbc.ca. So as part of the welcome, we want to say that CCHS is based in the Metro Vancouver area, which is hosted on the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations territory. Although we are not sharing space today, we continue to benefit from the ongoing dispossession and displacement of First Nations people wherever we are streaming. So about this project, in 2017, community activism and youth engagement was stoked by the 105 Kiefer controversy. In the wake of this energy, CCH has wanted to document and capture these ongoing tensions and, in particular, youth experiences with this issue. 105 Kiefer is unique in its digital engagement. Twitter, Facebook, and local websites were all major vehicles for community activism. For the first phase of this project, we hired a student from UBC's ACAM program to help us conduct archival research and community interviews to produce a, research, a report on the social media movement around the 105 Kiefer controversy here in Vancouver's Chinatown. The next phase involved interviewing community members for their personal experiences with 105 Kiefer, as conducted by Amanda Wan. Amanda is a Han Chinese student and settler raised by immigrant settler parents on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. They are currently completing an MA in English with research and organizing interests in queer diasporic literatures and visualities. She is currently focused on the aesthetics of racial melancholia, intergenerational trauma, and the affect and psychic landscapes continually haunted by colonial violence. Contexts include post-colonial, psychoanalytic, and critical race, gender, and sexuality theories, alongside visuality and techno-orientalism. Today, we'll be watching the two videos produced as a result of her research, followed by a Q&A panel. We hope this event helps highlight the diverse experiences we all have with Chinatown and helps you reflect on your personal relationship with this neighborhood and the 105 key for controversy. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Amanda. Hey, thank you, Christy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna start screen sharing um, the video and, okay, let's see. Oops, sorry, gotta get the sound on as well. Okay, um, is everyone, can everyone see this? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, I will start without further ado. In 2010, the city of Vancouver increased tight limits for buildings and developments in Chinatown. In 2012, three condo developments were built at these increased heights, spurring concerns around gentrification and a lack of affordable housing in a low-income neighborhood. In May 2017, over 200 people arrived at City of Vancouver's Council Chambers to talk about proposed developments for the 105 Kiefer site in Vancouver's Chinatown. Over a record-breaking period of four days, hundreds of speeches were presented about the meaning of Chinatown as a living memory. This public hearing focused on a development proposal by BD Living for 105 Kiefer. During the public hearing, many speakers and witnesses used Twitter to connect and shape the stories that are being woven about Chinatown every day. The hashtag they used? 105 Kiefer. In September 2014, BD Living submits a development application to the City of Vancouver for a 13-story apartment building at 105 Kiefer. The application will go through three more drafts before reaching a fifth version in May 2017. 
On Tuesday, May 23rd, the public hearing begins in the City of Vancouver's Council Chambers regarding BD Living's rezoning application. A mixture of Chinatown and downtown Eastside residents, artists, activists, and community organizers of multiple generations offer their points about why the development application should be rejected. Every day, dozens of speakers await their turn to speak, with dozens more outside or at home watching from a live stream. The sheer number of speakers extends the public hearing to May 25th, 26th, and 29th, and the final vote is deferred to June 13th. The list of concerns about BD Living's application for the 105 Kiefer site stretches far and deep. Ongoing gentrification and displacement of low-income, black, indigenous, and people of color in Chinatown and the downtown east side, all within the context of the city's colonial history and ongoing present. Meanwhile, the 105 Kiefer hashtag becomes a source of live tweets, commentary along the live stream, dialogue, critique, resource sharing, community building, and sometimes conflict. Mainstream news media takes notice of the hashtag too, some including one of five keeper tweets in online news articles about the public hearing and issues raised in speeches. Discussion wraps up on June 13th. The council votes 8-3 to three against the development application. After five long sessions, the application has been rejected. How is the 105 of Kiefer public hearing significant? The vocal majority of speakers were opposed to the development proposal. A common thread throughout speeches was personal connection to Chinatown, gentrification, displacement, and further criminalization of people who are made vulnerable to mass development. At the public hearings, many types of support stood out. Some brought food to share for the long days. Others arranged rides to and from City Hall. Some translated information, reviewed speeches for each other, live tweeted, or checked in with each other's after each section. This did not mean there were never conflicts. An important platform for public education on the public hearing, Twitter also became a platform for some to perpetuate racism and dehumanization. One thing became clear, it takes great emotional, social, and political labor around collective community building to make change. 105 Kiefer was a site of contention. It also became a site where those who commit to justice every day could imagine transformation. So what does Chinatown mean to you? At the time of this film's production, it has been three years since the public hearing around 105 Kiefer, but the conversation isn't over yet. I'm here today to oppose the rezoning of 105 Kiefer. When we consider the rapid changes of development going on in Chinatown today, we need to fully understand how the new forms of racism, classism, and white supremacy affect multiple communities, not just the Chinese community, which to me makes the rezoning of 105 Kiefer all the more devastating as if it wasn't problematic enough. So many unnamed others in history are my adopted ancestors. I commemorate them today by speaking in opposition to the BD proposal on 105 Kiefer. It's been repeated these past three plus days, but I will reiterate, just because it's called social housing doesn't mean that it's actually affordable to those who most need it. It is becoming more and more apparent to me that what is happening here now is simply a continuation to what has happened to Chinatown in the past. The differences are, instead of burning buildings, they are being torn down for redevelopment. Instead of smashing windows, they are being covered up with wooden boarding, for lease signs, and feel-good attempts at looking to promote Chinese heritage. 
Instead of white people marching down the streets with torches, we have rich upper and middle class white folks opening up high end coffee shops, expensive restaurants, fancy grocery stores, and zones of exclusion. Instead of Chinese people being forced into a community, they are now being forced out alongside poor, low income, and disabled people, regardless of ethnicity. For some time, people from my community were simply not allowed to live anywhere else. Now you are telling us we cannot stay, and some of us have nowhere to go. I didn't grow up in Chinatown. I don't have ancestors who grew up in Chinatown. So at first I was like, who am I to be here? And I really questioned my role. Am I taking up space that somebody else could have? If it weren't for the fact that people are like, hey, come here, do this. If no one's inviting me, I wouldn't be coming. But if I'm invited, then yeah, that is a huge motivation. I think something important for people to think about is what is what is your role in Chinatown? What are you doing in Chinatown? There's so many layers to it. I mean, the first layer is that like we're on unceded indigenous territory, so it's like stolen, right? And on top of that, Chinatown was built with a history of legislative discrimination. We can go anywhere else. What am I doing to the people around me and what am I doing to myself? when I'm there. My involvement was sort of continuing history and like keeping something that has always been alive alive. When I saw it more like that, as opposed to having like an essentialist idea of what community is, I felt more able to participate because that I saw that as my role. It is a very privileged position to be when you enter a low income space, but you're not from it. And with a space that has like a long history with racism um, and colonialism. There's always like baggage and power dynamics involved. The Asian diaspora is such a large umbrella kind of term. I think about a lot of the voices that have been forgotten and a lot of the voices that are underrepresented even within our own community. There are a lot of overlaps I, I found, and some of these things often occur in talking about how lateral violence has disenfranchised all of us. As a Vietnamese person, I think a lot of people tend to feel a little bit confused as to why I do my work uh, in Chinatown. People like my parents, when they first came to Vancouver, Chinatown was a really important place for them to be able to find a sense of community or a sense of closeness to what they had to leave behind. My history coming into Vancouver's Chinatown, but also more broadly my parents' story of being in Vancouver, it doesn't quite neatly fit into these stories. Chinatown has always been really important to uh, my family and also the Vietnamese community in Vancouver as well. But we have to understand that this history has full of nuances. And I just want to expand a little bit more on your question about what a just Chinatown is that we begin to embrace the many voices that are here, that have been present, and also the voices that we have ignored. To bring that out and to hold space for these conversations is what I want to see more of in Chinatown. Something that I, I go back to lots is intergenerational knowledge sharing and how difficult it is sometimes to access events that occurred before, for example, 105 Kiefer, to build to what we are at now. Experiences are art. The things that we hold in our hearts are art. The yearning that we have for identity and belonging is art. I've actually like been lucky enough to facilitate a couple of art workshops and working with uh, people in the downtown east side as well as like trauma and children especially. So and I see even for myself that art is incredibly healing in so many different ways. And in terms of social and emotional relationships, I mean we're just human. It's so incredibly vital to have those in our lives and to have them be reciprocated by others. And when it comes to the downtown east side in China, there's so much stigma and gentrification and other things happening that they're not, not fully receiving this, especially from like a public platform. Like I think the way to the best way to um, challenge yourself and learn is to always question what you're creating, right? Especially with the downtown east and the opioid crisis that's currently occurring, harm reduction is so vital and so important, right? There's so much stigma 
with, with like how harm reduction works and these processes are actually really helping people and saving lives and because like they're not being implemented or like they're being deterred lives are being lost especially in Chinatown like there's this idea of safety like there's like I think there's tours now of like where kids will go in and be like don't end up here blah 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 this is awful there's so much stigma attached to this right and it's like just also creating unsafe spaces for these individuals who like reside here what I would personally like to see in terms of community organizing is more acknowledgement that there isn't just one community I think when people say Chinatown or the downtown east side there are a lot of connotations attached with that and people have an imagined view of what that demographic is. Chinatown is situated in the downtown east side but they're almost viewed as two separate entities that there should be an acknowledgement that they are their own things but I don't think that they can exist in stasis of each other. It's often viewed as there being a finite amount of resources and community groups having to compete for certain things. Emotional and social relationships are really for me everything about organizing. Before, to be honest, I felt a little bit, not unwelcome, but a little out of place in Chinatown, mainly because I'm not Chinese. So those relationships sort of reminded me that historically, as well as presently, people exist, thrive in Chinatown because of um, interrelations uh, with one another and not because you're a part of a certain ethnic group or whatever. One thing that I do get frustrated in, in organizing is that when you need because you have to form these strategic relationships with certain groups, with certain people. That's understandable because that's how you get your organizing to have an actual impact. However, because relationships can just focus around those strategic motivations, it ends up just becoming that kind of thing and not going back to the whole point of the community initiative or whatever it is. But also it's important to like to have that sort of division between professional and personal relationships. It's about being genuine, particularly in community work, because you're working with people and working with things that are very sensitive to people. So it's important to actually be genuine because it will show through your work as well as the outcomes, whatever you end up doing in the community. I mean, no one's exactly told me like, you know, you can't be here because you're uh, not Chinese. But thinking about being that sort of like East Asian privilege and feeling perhaps of ownership of the neighborhood into community relations based on historical ties, such as between East Asian Chinese uh, communities, Muslim communities, for instance, as well as East Asian Vietnamese refugees who found solace in Chinatown, the historical presence of indigenous peoples in Chinatown before it was Chinatown, but also after it became Chinatown. It's weird because I have all of these relationships to Chinatown, but I have all of these ties that I still, even now, still don't consider myself part of the Chinatown community. I'm actually not sure if it is my ethnicity or I didn't grow up here, for example, and I want to take up space where I shouldn't be. My friend told me the other day, yeah, it sounds like you're part of the Chinatown community. It sounds like you have a form of imposter syndrome. Those things that I mentioned, it impacts the way I view the emotional community relationships form in this space because it feels like you have to be a certain person to have those relationships or have those relationships in a particular way. Also with like the hesitation I pointed out to you in participating in this, I've been sort of watching from the sidelines and I've only very recently become involved in Chinatown, so I sort of felt like I'm not supposed to be who you're talking to. What I imagine from Chinatown is that everybody's needs get met and taken care of and people have a place to go and, and feel like they can belong and that they can learn and that they can connect with other people and feel cared for. That's the dream. Yeah, that's the dream.
Okay, sorry, Christy, I thought you were about to talk. So I didn't. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so we have about uh, half an hour left, I want to say. So we thought it'd be nice to have um, a few of the people who were able to join us from the video interviews um, to actually be part of this event, but also to answer some, to respond to some um, questions that um, might come up for uh, people viewing the video, but also um, some that I've prepared ahead of time um, so that they can choose any of these qu uh, questions and respond to them um, with about five to seven minutes each. So today we actually have, um, Kimberly Wong, Tyler Mark, Rachel Lau, um, and Jane Shi. Um, and so I will go ahead and screen share again and then um, present the questions so that we can go ahead with the panel and talk back. Um, okay. So we have a few questions. I'll read them out, but um, you can choose um, one or all of them, um, depending on what you would like to talk about. Um, so the first one is, how have your experiences with relationship building and or community organizing changed in relation to what you shared in your interview? So of course, um, the events of Kiefer, 105 Kiefer have taken place three years ago, um, and the, interview, the interviews themselves were actually about a year ago now. So obviously things change. Um, so that's one question I had. Um, the second one was, kind of similar, but maybe different. Uh, what kinds of relationships and structures and resources make you feel supported um, and able to be present, whether it's in organizing or other areas of life, because of course, um, it's not always easy to separate your organizing work and art and um, just what you do in your life every day. And then the third one is kind of more of an interactive one. Um, if any of you have any questions for actually other panelists or other people in the video um, that you wanted to share, because I know um, I never, uh, there was never actually like a full um, interview where everyone in the videos were present at the same time. It was actually separate interviews. Um, so that's, this is one space maybe where you can share uh, any questions you have, if you have any. Um, okay, so those are the three questions. Um, again, either you can choose any that you want to um, go with. So maybe we'll do, um, since we don't have too much time, maybe we can do Zoom tag. Um, and then if you really need to pass, we can pass and then come back to you. So maybe I will start um, with Rachel and then you can um, tag someone else when you're ready uh, after you've responded. Yeah. Okay, for sure. Thanks, Amanda. Um, also really beautiful short films. I really enjoyed watching both of them. And it, as I was reflecting on it, it made me think about how it's already been three years <laughs> since the hearing, and it doesn't feel that long ago. Um, one of the things that I actually was thinking about today in relation to the first question, which was about how uh, our relationships have changed to organizing, um, and I guess specifically my relationship to Chinatown. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about, and I think this is true for any community who has had any kind of struggle that's been highly televised or covered by the press is that once the cameras are gone and once the journalists are gone and once a lot of the rest of the world has moved on from the issue there's still work to be done and so i think a lot of what i've been thinking about is okay what do we do now now that they've rejected the 105 application and there was all of this surge of energy from the community coming together to organize and now that that is over it's like okay how do we continue that momentum forward in serving our community specifically um the chinatown community and more broadly the downtown east side community because as the film was suggesting they're all connected and so i've been thinking a lot about that in the past year and uh I've been really privileged to be able to work with um, Yarrow Intergenerational Society for Justice, uh, for those who are familiar. And if you're not, they're a nonprofit based in Vancouver's Chinatown who focuses, as the name suggests, on intergenerational relationships in Chinatown. And so I've been doing some work through the uh, Speak My Language project, which primarily focuses on Chinese seniors' experiences 
uh, with accessing healthcare in, in BC, specifically around language barriers. So we created a radio documentary series around that uh, with youth as well as the seniors. Uh, and more recently with COVID and the change of that, it's been really, I don't know if interesting is the word I want to use, but I've definitely observed the ways that people are being more creative about how they can stay connected to community. And so actually just today, my sister and I, we were delivering groceries to uh, Chinese seniors um, in like the downtown east side area and Chinatown area who are really leaving their homes because of the pandemic. So that's how my relationship has changed to community organizing since um, 105 Kiefer and some of the things that I've been thinking about since then. Okay, and a tag, right? <laughs> okay. I'm going to tag Tyler. Maybe on this side of the screen, dude. <laughs> okay, I've been tagged. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess in sort of reference to what Rachel was saying, um, I have, I've sort of always had these thoughts, but they've really been solidified during pandemic. It's just this, really to stress that um, community labor and community organizing is work, and it's often emotional labor, and it's often um, unpaid emotional labor and so with the facilitation of technology and you know everyone's on zoom now um, especially when you're doing work within communities it, you're never truly off the clock if that makes sense because individuals who have to do this type of work are constantly living through these experiences because they are parts of the community themselves and so um, I do think it's really important just to take time and to acknowledge that burnout is really real and Oftentimes, a lot of the work that happens behind the scenes and things that aren't spotlighted within media, um, it's often that intangible work that community organizers do and doesn't necessarily always get recognized. So even in Amanda making this like amazing film, um, I'm sure there was a lot of work that like, goes on behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see. And so I think it's important just to acknowledge that kind of work. Yeah, um, I guess I will tag Kim. <laughs> Cool, I've been tagged. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that beautiful film. The graphics were on point and nothing less than I would expect from you, Amanda. Um, I've been reflecting a lot on, on what Tyler spoke about in the short film, um, about Chinatown being seen and categorized as aside from the downtown east side very often. Um, this concept is, is also very much so a historical one. Um, on many different scales. Sometimes it's neighborhoods being pitted against each other by a governing body like the city of Vancouver uh, to fight for the same land that was never theirs to give away in the first place. Sometimes it's racialized groups being promised different things to create confusion and animosity between them. Um, but I sit as uh, one of two co-chairs along with Michael Tan for the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group and we're a city of Vancouver group that acts much like an advisory committee partially actually in response to the 105 Kiefer uh, public hearings where they saw a lot of different community groups come out uh, speaking uh, mostly in opposition, like said in the film, to it. Um, but the Legacy Stewardship Group is to, to steward initiatives that secure the legacy of Vancouver's Chinatown as a neighborhood that has significance for many diverse communities of color in Vancouver and that works within municipal system to speak on behalf of Chinatown to work collaboratively on things like the Northeast Falls Creek plan, for example, with host nations to ensure that um, people of color aren't putting against each other for the city's benefit. Um, there are a lot of barriers to this kind of work, of course. Um, I think stepping into the, the world of organizing in Chinatown, actually the day that 105 Kiefer, the first hearing happened, was the day that I came back from Hong Kong on a flight um, from a very life-changing trip. Um, and it's like, you know, many asterisks, including trudging through systems of patriarchy and fervent community infighting and transphobia and more. It makes organizing in Chinatown kind of like, you know, it, it makes you think that the things that you hold tight, the things that keep you in Chinatown that are cozy, um, are mutually exclusive from the work that has to be done. Uh, but that's not true. Um, so despite this, I think there are, there are certainly elders who want to share stories of things like the freeway fight that helps set context for things like 105 Kiefer and the work that needs to happen post 105 Kiefer. Um, folks like Shirley Chan and Tane Wei and Fred Ma, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I'll end there. And I will tag Jane. Hello. 
Well, thank you so much, Kimberly, and thank you so much, Amanda, and everyone else for organizing this. Like, I watched the videos before the panel just to see, <laughs> just to prep, and it was just like, my heart was right back there, and it was like, so many feelings. Um, yeah, I guess like something that I've been thinking about, especially in the context of the pandemic, is access and the access to community connections is right now at least it's very strained like a lot of us um, have access to technology some of us have access to language and others don't some of us have access to cars and others don't some of us are able to leave the house more regularly than others and others don't and so it's a, a really a time of amplified like everything that was true about our communities are amplified even further and it sort of like calls on all of us to sit with that and really consider like, oh man, I'm feeling really bad that I'm not reaching out to the seniors that I've been reaching out to before that I would say hi to on the re regular. I'm not going to the bun shop. I'm not, um, you know, like it, 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 it feels strange. Um, but at the same time, this is um, like, a time to reflect as well on everything that we and I have personally learned from 105 Kiefer. Like, I feel like I came into the thing like really new and not really understanding what my role is. And it was just um, a lot of reflection from that uh, based on um, what it means to come together as a coalition and what is needed in the coalition and what are the various tools that are useful in a coalition. I think some of the footage was from um, the Wet'suwet'en uh, Solidarity uh, <laughs> Better Making that Kimberly and I and others organized. And it just, for me, it was so important to bring like all of these pieces together um, and not only translate across language, but also translate across issues and time. And um, yeah, just sitting with, the complexity of this moment right now it's 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 yeah like for me i don't have any concrete answers about um what's how my relationship to chinatown has changed because it's like i'm just so unsure of like how to navigate but like a part of me like really wants to hold on to the fact that we all have different roles um to play and they're all really equally important and even if they're not equally recognize um i sort of sort of i organize um uh so we press vancouver is a arts collective in the downtown east side and we we ran several workshops with seniors and they were based on art and storytelling and we recorded them and um, translated all of those stories and it is definitely taking a very long time but it is just part of the process of witnessing and making sure that like everyone is able to hold on to the history of Chinatown and understand the complexity of what it is um, through at least some of the voices because it is just some of the voices that are in the neighborhood. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, those are like, of course, um... I've had the pleasure of being able to listen to you all speak during the interviews too, but I'm really glad to, that we're all here, like that some of us are here and you're able to share these insights and like just, of course, as usual, um, being really wise and teaching me a lot as well. Um, so, okay, it looks like we do have time to continue with the, the three questions. Um, and then of course, if anyone in the audience has any questions, put them in the chat. Um, I think Kimberly has written one question um, for the other panelists in the chat. Um, Kimberly, is it okay if I paste in the, the chat for everyone? Okay. Um, sorry, everyone. And that's a question from Kimberly. And then you can take your time to look at it and whoever would like to speak um, can just take it up and then take again.
I guess I can speak um, to it. Um, yeah, in regards to Kim's question, I'll read it out. Um, how has mentorship played a role in the in the organizing that you do, aka being a member or having a mentor? Um, I would say for me, it's this whole like journey of participating within Chinatown has been just that a journey. And so um, I guess coming from the the background as someone who's half Chinese and half Japanese where my great grandparents came to Canada. So I guess that makes me like third or fourth generation. Um, I kind of, as a child, I went to Chinatown quite often. And then, you know, during my high school years, I kind of fell out of contact with Chinatown because my family moved out of the downtown east side and we were living more um, closer to the west side. Um, and so it really wasn't until university that where I got in contact with um, professors and students who shared similar interests to me that I kind, that kind of rekindled and sparked my, my love and nostalgia for Chinatown um, that I always had, but just didn't really know how to work through, if that makes sense. And so um, it was in university when I did my master's um, and I had the opportunity to do my own research, I chose to do my research on, um, I studied urban planning and I chose to do my research on what culturally appropriate planning looks like and how we engage communities that come from marginalized positions. And I used 105 Kiefer as sort of a case study. Um, so coming from a place where I had a sense of community of Chinatown when I was young, but had changed over those next like 15 years and that evolved, I didn't really know how to get in contact with people because I didn't want to just force myself back into this community, um, even though I did feel like I had a connection there. And so it was so important that I had mentors um, and people who are from the Chinatown community that opened themselves up to me and like opened me and welcomed me to the community with open arms. Um, that was really special for me. and. Um, I'm thinking in regards to what Phoebe was saying in the film, how she at times didn't really feel like she had a place. Um, it really just means a lot, I think, not only to have someone to kind of show you and talk you through things, but just to get that sense of community that you get when you go to your local Tsatsanteng or you have tea with an auntie um, in Chinatown Plaza or play Mahjong with people. It's those small things that I don't think people maybe think of as mentorship. But just being able to share stories and talk with people, um, that was really important for me, I think, yeah. Um, I don't know if other people, yeah, tag Rachel. <laughs> this is a, some of, some of you may have saw my reaction to it, I'm like, oh, it's such a hard question because this is something that I've been thinking about from jump uh, of becoming involved with Chinatown was actually how, I felt like there was a lack of mentorship, at least from someone of an older generation, because I think as a as a as a queer and trans like Chinese person who's trying to find their place of belonging in in the Chinatown community um, and trying to organize and create there, it, it can it can be really hard to find other queer and trans like Chinese people who are older than you who have also done that work and can guide you along, and so. I think that was always something I felt like was lacking and something I was looking for and frankly am still looking for uh, within the Chinatown community as someone who's still doing work there. Uh, but I want to say that the places that I have found a sense of mentorship and guidance are actually from other queer and trans Chinese people in Chinatown. A lot of the people who are on this call right now, <laughs> um, I found a lot of um, guidance from and I was turning to them and asking them, but you know, what do you know? Like, what have you seen? What have you experienced? How do you navigate these things that really helped me learn and grow as a, as a person in the community, as an organizer, as an artist. And I think something that I don't, I don't know if people talk about this as much, but I think a universal truth is that like, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> And once you come to understand that, it's like so much more comforting because the thing is everyone's just feeling their way through what they're doing. And even the people who look like, you know, they have their life together, chances are 
they're also a little lost and that's fine and that's okay and I think that uh, a big lesson that I've learned and also something that I've come to accept for myself is that like okay it's okay that I don't know everything and that I don't have all the experiences or all the answers the important part is that I'm willing to learn and to listen to uh, what other people's experiences have been and also what their thoughts are and being open to making mistakes and learning and sharing because I think without that then we won't get really far it's just like if we if we cast away people who as soon as they make mistakes and you'll be a community of one pretty fast <laughs> It's not going to last too long. So that's what I think about mentorship and what um, that's been like for me. And it's funny to think that with the Speak My Language project specifically, I was the so-called like project coordinator or the lead artist or whatever <laughs> the title was. And so I was mentoring these youth producers and creating these documentaries. And I thought to myself like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm mentoring you? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think sometimes it's also about trusting yourself and the work that you've done and the knowledge that you've gained but also being humble enough to say like you know I don't have all the answers and chances are I'll learn things from the people that I'm mentoring to I don't think those roles are as binaristic or um, set as it might seem I think they're a lot more fluid and should be more fluid um, yeah so that's what I think of that question really good question Kim Um, yeah, everything that both of you said, uh, I guess like when I think of mentors and mentorship, the image of like the hungry ghost comes to mind because I feel like I am a hungry ghost for mentorship. Um, there's just so many things that as like a queer person, as a non-binary person, as like an autistic person, I'm just like, where are my mentors? As a Chinese person who's estranged um, from so many, cut off from so many parts of um, my like community, like men, like the, the, the act of yearning and the act of seeking mentorship and the, act, the, the feeling like responsible for other people um, at the same time as wanting mentorship is just like a constant, is a constant. And so, yeah, I really, feel like it's something that is part of it, it's like integral to the work itself like I there is no community organizing without some kind of co-mentorship like like we kind of mentor one another and we kind of keep ourselves and one another in check and um and just like one of the questions within the videos is like who's um being heard and who's being ignored it's just like always like wondering like hey who else is there to talk to um and it, um, yeah, like something that is hard to remember, but I always try to remember is that I am not alone and we are not alone and together when we like bring our voices together and when we sort of, every time we come together and witness each other's like struggles and pain and joys, um, like we enact some kind of mentorship within the community. I have potentially something to add. I got a message from um, one of the participants just now um, asking a question that I guess I would like to bring up to the other panelists as well on um, how to change, how can we change institutions like the city of Vancouver to be more sensitive and to respond to community concerns. Um, from my, like I guess from my lived experiences, one of I keep for the reason why it was such an interesting case was that it was one of the few times that it felt like the city had to listen because in a lot of situations where um, especially in a city like Vancouver where housing is so limited it's very rare for a city to turn down applications when they are in regards to housing so I think that really goes to show the role of the community in having their say um, and so maybe this is sort of in reference to the second question that Amanda brought up, but I, I, I think it's, I feel there is a need to be present, I suppose, when we are able to hold these types of conversations that are often uncomfortable. Um, and I don't mean this necessarily in a politicized space like a public hearing, but 
I think it's important to talk to people who have different opinions from you. Um, through my work, I've talked to a lot of people who spoke favorably about 105 Kiefer and who speak favorably about gentrification within Chinatown. And even though these aren't necessarily opinions that I agree with, I do find that it forces me to empathize and recognize my own privilege as someone who doesn't live in Chinatown and who has the privilege to come in and out of Chinatown as I please to do my work. Um, I don't need to worry about my storefront getting broken into. I don't need to worry about having to find shelter now that it's getting colder. And so I do 100% agree that these are valid concerns. And so people who come from these types of lived experiences may think a different way than me. Um, and so those types of things really force me to be present. And so as a community organizer, I would say it's really important to hear other opinions and to collaborate with neighboring communities, um, communities that intersect with your own, because we can't necessarily get the city to listen um, if we're just kind of doing our own thing and staying in our own lane. Um, I think it's really important for folks within Chinatown to interact, you know, socially distance, interact with people from the downtown east side um, that we don't necessarily think of as being part of our community, or people who live um, or who used to live or who work in Hogan's Alley and to really be present and show allyship. And I think we won't get the city to listen if it's constantly a battle of having to compete for space um, amongst these different communities. And so I think that's the first sort of step in getting the city to kind of listen. Thank you for bringing up that question, Tyler. And um, yeah, like just to kind of echo what Tyler said, um, do any of the other panelists want to speak a little to that or bring up any other questions or comments? I, just going off of what Tyler said about 105 Kiefer and the differing opinions, I, I recall that one of the things that was mentioned by some of the speakers at City Hall was saying, you know, this is as good as we're going to get. You know, they're giving us X amount of social housing and they're going to give us a community space. So if we don't say yes to this now, nothing better will come along. And I get it. Like I hear that kind of like wanting of like some kind of community space or like wanting security of housing and, and kind of taking what's being like offered to you. And I think one of the, important things to consider when we're thinking about having the city listen to us is also not listening to what the city has to say about like what the limits are. I think that it's really easy to settle for, okay, they're saying like, oh, this is what's possible. So take it or leave it. And I think that that often puts a lot of people in a position where they're not getting what they deserve, which is like housing, security, sense of community, a sense of belonging. And so I think something else important to consider when getting the city to listen to us is like how big can we dream and then how you know how can we come together to like show them that dream and say like this is what we think and this is what we want and we're not going to settle for anything less um, because I think that that happens way too often is when communities come together and they say this is what we want we want let's say 100% social housing which was something that was brought up I think for the a lot at West Hastings. It was the other um, sort of like site of contention at, around the same time that community organizers were organizing around. And they said, we want 100% social housing and we want the whole building to be social housing. And the city is like, are you kidding me? That's not possible. And they're like, we won't settle for anything less. So, you know, take our offer or leave it. And I think that we need that kind of um, boldness when it comes to thinking about our futures and what we want to see in our communities. Um, just picking up on some of the themes that both of you folks have spoken on, both Rachel and Tyler. Um, when the city looks to speak to racialized communities, it's often done with a monofocus view. As in, we want to engage with the Chinatown community, and that means we need to talk to an overarching association that speaks for the community. And for a long time, for example, this was the CBA, the Chinese Benevolent Association. And, and that's still ingrained with the systems that I was speaking about earlier in patriarchy and largely, I mean, for example, Chinese nationalism, if I can say it, um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, leaders in the community that are talking to government, 
um, that would never even think about speaking with half the people on this panel. So I think part of it is ensuring that we have people in leadership positions within Chinatown that are able to be that intermediary, that are able to speak for you know, equity and justice, um, doing that bridging work um, so that people like the people on this panel can push that further so that they can dream you know, as big as they want to dream, like Rachel said. And it is often, unfortunately, done where one person is the only person of their kind in that room. Um, and by that way, by the way, I'm speaking about myself because <laughs> I am one of I am the only woman in leadership spaces in Chinatown elected right now. It's lonely. <laughs> Jane, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, what you said, what all of you said reminded me of uh, Vancouver, BC and Canada's apology to Chinese Canadians and the various kinds of apologies that kind of happen and the various things that happen as a result of those apologies. Like, I always think about that because, like, what is accountability from a colonial nation, colonial province, colonial city? Like, how can they apologize to certain people and give some money to some people and not the rest of us? How can um, their, how can this apology, so-called apology be real if there are people who, I mean, there aren't enough, I mean, like, if we, like some of the people who do translation work for uh, medical appointments or like, like housing stuff, like how, why is it that community has to come together to have that um, when they say it's all okay after the apology, right? Like, yeah, I just think that like, what Rachel was saying about demanding more and, and what Kimberly is talking about with, with regards to the traditional patriarchy of um, what is seen as Chinatown. Um, like we, it, we don't have to wait for anyone's permission to demand more. Like I just off the top of my head, I'm like, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was an intergenerational, like feminist, like, like community where like survivors, both like youth and the elders can come together and heal together because that is some of the things that should be happening, but isn't necessarily, but nobody's asked me for, <laughs> nobody asked me for my opinion on that, yeah. Just to, so I'm just keeping time, and I know there are a few more questions that people have posed in the messages, so maybe I'll read them out loud, and then um, any of you can just speak to maybe like one of them, and then um, of course, if you're not able to, those are really good questions, like everyone's questions that are posed so far are really good to just kind of leave with as well. So, um, and then after um, these last few questions, maybe I'll turn it back to CCHS to do closing announcements. So I will just read out the three questions. I also posted them in the chat, um, but I can reiterate them. So a couple more. So one of them is, as youth and activists, what do you envision for the future of Chinatown? So that's the first one. The second one is, um, how do you reconcile that your work is another person's living space? And that one was kind of um, already addressed by Tyler and as well as other people in the video and today. Um, and then a third one is, I'm curious about mentor how mentorship expands the space that you ask for and demand more for community if panelists are interested in talking about it. Um, so I know those are all big and really good questions, but if any of you feel like um, responding to any of them, feel free to start. Also noticing that um, I think Rachel has suggested that we can also just use the 105 Keeper hashtag afterwards um, to respond to these questions. Um, and it'll be actually kind of fun to like revive that hashtag in a way. Um, yeah, but if any of you have thoughts right now, you can share, but if not, we can also just um, leave those hanging for now. Um, I guess I wouldn't mind briefly touching upon the question as youth and activists, what do you envision for the future of Chinatown? That's like a really big question, but since we're on the topic of thinking big, um, I guess I'll touch upon that one. Um, for me personally, I would like to see more collaboration amongst different types of people. Um, 
as like a cis male, I definitely recognize that Chinatown is a space primarily dominated by cis dudes. Um, and so I think it's really important to make space for other people. And because, you know, there are a lot of elders within the community and now there is sort of this surge of youth coming into the neighborhood, there is, I would say it's starting that there is some intergenerational dialogue, but we have to kind of do twice as much legwork because there is that missing middle. A lot of elders worked really hard so that their children didn't necessarily have to live in Chinatown. And I mean, for very good reason, there's a whole history there that you can look up. And so for a long time, there was this missing generation in Chinatown. And so it almost in a way has become the burden of people, of folks close to my age to kind of have to make space for ourselves because there wasn't that, that was never paved for us to begin with. Um, so I would love to see more folks in Chinatown, um, probably after pandemic, but to, if people are going to open their businesses or operate or do community work, I think you really need to understand the history and just talk to the people who already live there. There's no use in assuming what it is that the community wants or speaking on behalf of a community. Um, you can say, yes, the, the community needs business, the community needs money, but who, how, from what perspective are you saying this from and like, who have you actually consulted? Um, so those are things that I would like to see for the future of Chinatown. Great, so does any of, do any of the other panels have any um, final comments before we turn it over to CC just again for final announcements? Okay, I will be, uh, yeah, I'll turn it over. I'll, um, I'll screen share again really briefly to share some announcements that CCHS has. Um, and then, yeah, as um, Tyler's comments and everyone's comments have been great so far. Um, and then I've, already, I've input the 105 Keeper hashtag link that people can check out afterwards just to reconvene almost like a reception area, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, so we will, okay, here's some, Announcements from CCHS. Christy, take it away. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you to all the panelists for doing this event with us. I just want to say that this has been a year long collaboration with Amanda and everyone else that's been involved. And there has been so much energy and so much commitment to sharing these, these uh, experiences. The conversation tonight was so insightful, so inspiring, so thoughtful. And I actually feel so invigorated that these are the youths who are trying, who are trying to lead their own movements in their own different communities and are passionate about Chinatown. I, I love the future visions that were shared tonight and I hope, I hope for the same. So we hope all the attendees tonight enjoy the conversation and we hope to see you at our future webinars as well, which you can learn more about at bchsbc.ca. Before we close off and let everyone go, we just want to let you know that nominations are open for the 2021 CCHS Awards. And this includes the undergraduate and graduate Ed Woodbrook Prizes, the Larry Wong Prize for Chinese Canadian Community and Public History, the Dr. Wallace B and Madeline Chung H. Chung Prize in Chinese Canadian Community Archiving, as well as the Ed, Wicker, Ed Wickberg Book Prize. If you've done any research in Chinese Canadian history this year, please, please apply. The undergraduate and graduate prizes come with a $1,000 award and other benefits with the society. And because of the pandemic, we're also accepting applications from students who are not currently enrolled, but were enrolled earlier this year as well. So thank you so much for coming tonight. And we hope to see you again at future events. Thank you again to all the panelists.